Hello class, Professor Mandeville back at Champlain Memorial Library. Uh, this is lecture six for History 101. And I want to just review a little bit. Uh, last lecture we talked about uh, several things, including the Rev War, sort of unofficially starting with the Battles of Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, followed by the capture of Fort Ty in May of 75. Very important meeting of the Second Continental Congress, uh, also in May of 1775. And then things are progressing towards the outright Declaration of Independence, which will occur, obviously, in July of 76. And the final thing uh, that we want to mention that happens in 1775, if we go back to our original handout here, the very last item on the bottom, the Prohibitory Act, passed in December of 70, 1775 by Parliament in response to things heating up in the colonies, and also in response to uh, the outright boycott uh, that the First Continental Congress had placed upon uh, the Brits, both uh, their uh, manufactured goods and not selling them raw materials. So uh, this basically tells the colonists that since you've cut off trade totally with us, we're going to consider any ship that we find on the high seas to be smuggling. So if we find any colonial ships on the high seas, we're going to immediately seize them. They will become property of the British government. The crew will all then be immediately, I guess you could call it drafted, into the British Navy, and they're going to have to serve on British naval vessels patrolling the colonial coast looking for other privateers who are engaged in the same quote-unquote smuggling activities that Parliament has deemed this. Now, this is very detested by the colonists, and they claim that this forcing them into the British Navy off these privateer ships is impressment of sailors, which is the practice of one country capturing another nation's sailors and forcing them into service in their nation's Navy. This was very prevalent before the War of 1812, and we'll talk about that later on uh, in the semester. The British countered this argument or claim of impressment by pointing out, you're still the British colonies. We're only making you serve in your Navy, the British Royal Navy. You don't have your own country, so this is an impressment of sailors. And remember, a key factor in December of 1775, we had not declared independence yet. So, on paper, the British are correct, but the colonists really hated this. So, what we want to do next is progress along with the conflict that is heating up, that is really the Revolutionary War. And uh, what's going to happen in later 1775, and I promised you we're going to be talking a lot about this individual, Benedict Arnold, fresh off his capture of Fort Ty in May, receives his next orders from General Washington, who has taken command of the Continental Army. Now, one thing you're all going to have to uh, do is... The overwhelming majority of you have one thought and one thought only of Benedict Arnold. He's a dirty, rotten, scumbag traitor that betrayed the country. That's not going to happen till much later in his military career. As you're going to find out, he was an American hero before he betrayed his country and sold the plans uh, to West Point to the British. So we're going to be talking about a lot of heroic things he does, especially right here in the Champlain Valley, uh, that made him a hero before he was a traitor. So Arnold receives commands 
from Washington that he and General Montgomery are going to leave Fort Ty and Crown Point and they're going to invade Canada in 1775. Uh, this is all going to happen. If you take a look at your map on page 141, you can see the trek that Montgomery takes in 1775 on Lake Champlain on the St. Lawrence. And then you'll notice that Arnold leaves Newburyport, uh, Massachusetts, sails to the mouth of the Kennebunk River in Maine, and that's the route he's going to take to Quebec City. <clears throat> now, the masterminded plan of Washington is, we'll capture Quebec City, and we'll be able to do so pretty easily because he believes that the French Canadians will assist us and want to be free just like our quest for freedom. That sounds good on paper, as we'll find out it doesn't quite work out that way. So, Arnold is going to get his men together, raise them in uh, New England. They sail up to the mouth of the Kennebunk River, and from there, his trek to Quebec is going to be one disaster after another. First, the river boats that were supposed to be all ready for him and his men are late in being completed and arrive late, which delays his trek up the Kennebunk as far as they can go into the wilderness of Maine uh, later into the fall. Uh, Arnold and his men are going to paddle up the Kennebunk as far as they can travel in their river boats, and then the rest of the trek to Quebec City is going to be made on foot in November and December. And it's going to get colder and colder because of all these delays they've experienced. And they're going to run out of food also. And it's going to get so bad that Arnold and his men in the wilderness of Maine and what is now the province of Quebec will resort to boiling their leather shoes to make soup out of them so they don't starve to death. And these very brave men that sacrificed their shoes for this soup, I suppose you'd call it, uh, then have to wrap their feet in rags and still march through the snow. These are some extremely brave men. Now, unfortunately, Arnold and Montgomery will not rendezvous in Quebec until New Year's Eve uh, in 1776, or excuse me, 75. <clears throat> Remember, this is all happening in late 75. Now, when they arrive, nothing goes correctly. The French Canadians do not rise up and assist the British troops that are stationed there. Uh, even though the force of British is relatively light, uh, they're smart enough to stay within the fort walls of the walled city and hold out and end up defeating Arnold and Montgomery. In fact, General Montgomery dies on the battlefield uh, in this battle in late December of 75. Arnold and his men camp out for the remainder of the winter, near there, <clears throat> and when more British reinforcements arrive in the spring, then they will retreat down the Saint, up the St. Lawrence and then on to Lake Champlain. During these battles, Arnold is also wounded. He's shot in the leg, and it's going to be everything he can do uh, to get what's left of his and Montgomery's men back to the Champlain Valley. Luckily, as a very capable man under his command, uh, Captain Daniel Morgan, who we'll be talking about later on, who is very instrumental in getting Arnold and everybody back. Now, they're going to make their way back down the Richelieu River in May, and on their way uh, 
uh, down the Richelieu River towards Lake Champlain, they'll <coughs> raid a uh, French-Canadian city on the Richelieu, Saint-Jean, Quebec, where the British have some small uh, forces there. And Arnold at, and his men at that point will steal two British ships and use them to make the rest of their way back down to Crown Point and Fort Ty. And they'll arrive back down uh, all the way to Fort Ty uh, by June of 76. Now, uh, on their way back, they'll camp along uh, the shore of the lake. In fact, one in, they'll have one encampment at Point Affair where the famous battle that Robert Rogers fought in during the French and Indian War. There's a memorial out on Point Affair to commemorate uh, a body of one of Arnold's men who uh, was buried on Point Affair and his remains were discovered much later. They were reinterred uh, about uh, 10 years ago in a celebration where we commemorated the monument. Uh, the recording of that whole celebration is in the welcome part of the class if you're interested in watching that. Uh, and another problem that Arnold and his men and Morgan had to deal with, a lot of his men were coming down with smallpox. Now, <clears throat> that's probably what caused the death of one of Arnold's men uh, that is honored at Point Affair. So when they do arrive at Crown Point, they're going to separate all the men who are suffering from smallpox they're going to isolate and quarantine them on the Vermont side near where Chimney Point, Vermont is at the Crown Point Bridge today. If you travel north from that bridge on your way to Virgins, there's a little area directly north of the bridge uh, and you'll see it labeled Hospital Creek. It got its name because that's where they built some hospitals as infirmaries for these men who were very ill with smallpox after the return from uh, the invasion of Quebec. This invasion failed, but not for lack of trying by Arnold Montgomery and Morgan. <clears throat> now, Arnold waits his next orders from General Washington. Washington next, uh, in June of 1776, is going to order Arnold to build America's very first Navy right on Lake Champlain. Now, Washington knows that the British are putting get together a Navy up on the Richelieu River. They're building it there. In fact, at St. Jean, where Arnold stole those two ships earlier in the year. And their plan is to invade New York via Lake Champlain. So in order to counter this invasion, Washington orders Arnold to sort of become Admiral Arnold also. The reason why he selects Arnold, Arnold is the only man that Washington has with any real uh, experience on ships. Arnold's father was a merchant, owned a fleet of ships, and Arnold sell, sailed to the Caribbean and Europe with his father on many occasions. <clears throat> so he was comfortable around a ship. Arnold will go down to the very southern end of Lake Champlain in a place that was called back then Skeensboro. Now, uh, Skeensboro was uh, what is today the city of Whitehall, New York. But back in this day and age, it was called Skeensboro because the person that started this small village, which had a wood mill and an iron forge, uh, was Philip Skeen. So Arnold goes there because there's an iron forge, there's a lumber mill to build his navy. He brings in shipwrights that he knows from Connecticut, where he's from, and they commenced to spend the entire rest of the summer constructing the American fleet. He's going to take his men 
<coughs> Excuse me, I need a drink of water here. And he's going to train these foot soldiers to be sailors. He's going to put together this Navy quite quickly. And by August, he's sailing this Navy around on Lake Champlain, training these men, teaching them how to fire cannon and so forth. And he's up and down the lake looking for a spot to best engage the British fleet that is near completion that will no doubt come down onto Lake Champlain from the Richelieu River, and it's going to be commanded by General Carleton. So all of this is going to lead to the famous Battle of Valcour that happens right in front of Clinton Community College. Now, uh, also in the meantime, one thing you need to also remind yourselves of, the Continental Congress has met again, and in July, well, really late June, they send Thomas Jefferson off to write the Declaration of Independence. He brings it back to the Continental Congress they approve it on July 4th, 1776, and we declare our independence. Now, you have a copy of the Declaration of Independence in the back of your textbook that you can take a look at. And in it, Jefferson lists the grievances against the King of England, against Parliament, and then basically sums it up saying, we have no choice. You've made our lives so miserable that we must declare independence. Obviously, the Brits look at this a different way. We're all treasonous devils. So, that has occurred while Arnold's building the Navy. And so, what I want you to do in the uh, mini-lecture where these are both being posted, there I have a, a, a link there that you can click on uh, for a short film known as, or the title of, is The Key to Liberty. It's produced by the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, and it shows you all that happens at the Battle of Valcour. Now, Arnold and his fleet will engage uh, General Carleton and his fleet right in the Straits of Valcour, between Valcour Island and the New York eastern shore. Uh, this battle will take place and Arnold and his small fleet are greatly outgunned uh, and outmanned by the professional British Navy that they've constructed up in St. Jean, Quebec. And uh, after the first day of the battle, as you'll see in the uh, film, uh, Arnold's men really take a licking. They lose several ships, a lot of men are killed, and they're regrouping because not only have they uh, suffered major losses, but they also are running out of gunpowder. So Arnold devises an ingenious plan that you'll see in the video to sneak his Navy out in the middle of the night <coughs> by placing lanterns in the back of each ship shrouding them on all sides so they can only be visible from the ship right behind them. They're going to hug the coast in very shallow waters, and they can do this because of all of Arnold's boats are flat-bottomed. The British boats are sailing vessels with deep hulls and keels. They can't go very close to the shore. And in fact, they saw a ship, one of Arnold's ships run aground by accident, and they're very cautious. So they're going to sneak out in the middle of the night, paddle right past uh, the British fleet who are regrouping and resting up for the next day's battle they think is going to ensue. And one thing you need to remember also is, back in this day and age, there's no fighting at night. Once night falls uh, reaches, all sides stop fighting, whether it's a water battle, a land battle, or whatever. Because obviously you have a better chance of shooting one of your own men than the enemy because there's no such thing as night vision goggles or anything like that. 
So when the British awake the next morning, it's extremely foggy. When the fog clears, they discover Arnold and his fleet are gone. Now, I think I failed to mention the dates. This all happens uh, October 11th, 12th, uh, in that neck of the woods in 1776, right in front of the college. And they talk about the dates in the uh, video, which you'll be watching too. I want you for sure to watch that. It's a very important video. Now, uh, there's an old wives tale up here in the North Country that uh, the British were mistaken and thought that the small island that's off the southern end of Velcor Island that locals today call Gunboat Island, they believed that the British mistaken, were mistaken and thought that was one of Arnold's ships in the fog and bombarded it with cannonball. That's all a wives' tale. If you go back and look at the British records, they never did that. Uh, obviously, they knew that wasn't one of Arnold's ships. It would have been right in the middle of their fleet where they were anchored. Plus, they saw the island all day long when they were fighting the day before. And if you look at maps back then, it was labeled Petit Island. Today, if you look at official maps of the state of New York, its real name is Garden Island. But it's one of those myths that exist in local lore, and I thought I'd clear that up for you. So when the British figure out Arnold's gone, they start scoping the horizon and they look to the south and they can see his, flit, his fleet down near what is today Schuyler Island to the south. <clears throat> They're going to go in hot pursuit. Arnold uh, and his men are much slower moving because they have flat bottom ships and they're not very good sailing vessels. They basically have to row, row them where the British ships are much faster. They're going to catch up with them the next day, sink some of more of Arnold's fleet, including the ship, the Spitfire. Arnold, uh, they'll capture the Washington. Arnold's, what's rest of his fleet will divide and three of his ships will make it safely back to Crown Point the main part of the fleet, consisting of four ships with Arnold on them, will end up sailing to the Vermont floor, shore <clears throat> near the small village of Patton, Vermont. The city, citizens of Patton will assist Arnold and his men escape from those ships, which he scuttles on the shore, which means he crashes them into the shore. Then after he has all of his men off board, he sets them on fire so they can't fall into British hands. That's also part of the act of scuttling a ship. Arnold and his men march inland, and then they safely march back down to Crown Point. <clears throat> By this time, it's mid-October. Carlton and his men continue to sail south, thinking they can complete their invasionary activities. But when they get past Crown Point, they notice that the Americans have built a gigantic fortress at, on the Vermont side, right across from Fort Ticonderoga at Mount Independence. And they have 10,000 men stationed there. The reason why that installation, which includes a Ford hospitals, the Horseshoe Battery and whatnot, right across the shore from Fort Ticonderoga facing north, where the British are coming from, is <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence was read there later in July, and they named it Mount Independence in its honor. Carleton realizes there's no way he can overtake this obstacle very quickly. There's snow in the air. It's getting close to late October. So... Carlton and his men turn around and go back to St. Jean, Quebec to wait out the winter, which will be arriving pretty soon, and obviously the lake freezes in many places. So the Battle of Valcour is so important because Arnold builds a navy out of nothing, stands up to the British, <coughs> even though 
on the surface, it appears like a defeat. He delays the British invasion for a full year, which allows us time to prepare for the next invasion that will happen next year, Burgoyne's campaign of 1777, and will ultimately lead to the great American victory at the Battle of Saratoga, which is generally considered by historians around the world as the real turning point of the American Revolution, pushing it in favor of an American victory. So, next class, we're going to pick up with Burgoyne's invasion in 1777 of the Champlain Valley, work our way to the Battle of Saratoga, and that tremendous victory by American forces, where once again, the hero, Benedict Arnold, will be engaged in this decisive victory. So, I'll be uh, lecturing to you again shortly. This is the end of Lecture 6. Take care. Uh, I'll be delivering Lecture 7 shortly. Bye now.